Okay, so we've been talking a lot about methane nitrous oxide emissions, kind of that 3% of the problem that has been pointed out uh, too many times. And earlier, you know, this session it was pointed out how carbon dioxide uh, across the whole greenhouse gas issue is 80% of the problem. And so I think it behooves us to at least spend a couple of minutes looking at carbon dioxide and carbon sequestration. And so uh, I'm a plant physiologist, an ecologist, not an animal person or a dairy person. So you're going to kind of get a, a perspective of, of, of looking at the carbon sequestration as, as this relates uh, to the issues that we're concerned about. Uh, just as kind of a preface or introduction, a lot of times you'll hear, hear people say that if you just do X, and X is whatever kind of magic elixir they're pushing at the time, if you do X, you can completely compensate, you can store enough carbon in the soil to completely compensate for all the emissions uh, throughout the world and, and the problem solved if you just do my thing, whatever my thing happens to be at the time. And I kind of like to think of that as like the Lake Wobegon effect, where uh, you find the very best result and you apply that to the whole world, and, and all our problems are solved. You know, if all the children are above average, then there's no problem. Uh, more realistic estimates that I've seen usually suggest that carbon sequestration can maybe remove about 5%, maybe 10% of the carbon dioxide emissions. And of course that uh, will become less and less as the amount of emissions go up and up. I don't think our sequestration is keeping up with the rate of emissions in, uh, in China and some of these other parts of the world. And so. I want to talk a little bit about some of my experience and our experience over the last few years looking at pasture management efforts that we have taken to try with our primary goal of increasing uh, productivity, pasture productivity, but looking at the effects that that's had on uh, soil carbon sequestration. Uh, and so we know that increasing soil carbon can help both mitigate and adapt to climate change as we increase uh, soil organic matter, it increases water holding capacity, it improves uh, uh, crop responses to drought, uh, and it also removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, reduces the farm carbon footprint. And so if you look in the literature, uh, some kind of general trends seem to appear uh, in the pasture literature, and one of them is that if you intensify management, increase uh, fertility, increase nutrient applications, uh, have a, more uh, grazings, more cuttings per year, that is often associated with an increase in the amount of carbon that can be stored in the soil. And a, a lot of people, I kind of think, you know, the more carbon you bring into the system, the more will eventually end up in the soil. Whereas if you have very extensive management, low fertility and, and uh, fewer harvests, then uh, you may not see any significant uh, carbon sequestration. And so uh, this uh, paper in 2001 made the uh, conclusion that in general management improvements that are intended to increase forage production usually will increase soil carbon. And that's just kind of a general rule of thumb. But we have to realize and that there is a limit to the amount of carbon that a soil can store on the, on the long term. And uh, a lot of pasture work is done where you're reintroducing perennial grasses into croplands that have been cropped for a, a number of years and the soil organic matter has been depleted. And then you go in with perennial crops and you refill, if you will, that, that bucket that the soil is. 
but at some point those stocks are replenished and you re reach new equilibrium again and you, you don't sequester yeah. the carbon anymore. So I want to talk about a couple of experiments that we've done and like I say looking at this relationship between pasture productivity and soil carbon sequestration in a couple of different ways that we went about trying to improve productivity. And first of all, just some uh, similarities in the experiments. Both of them uh, were long-term, nine-year exper experiments. Uh, they had similar management that included these, uh, included grazing. Uh, one the experiment, some of the fields were cut for hay uh, when that was appropriate, but generally these were grazing experiments. Similar soils, uh, we collected soil cores uh, every other year over that nine year period to a depth of, of one meter and then divided into the various segments and analyze them for soil carbon and nitrogen and uh, that'll be proved to be important in a few minutes you'll see that the depth to which we sampled and looking at these different increments within the soil profile that that has a significant impact on the conclusions you draw when you start talking about uh, carbon sequestration so the first of the two experiments was uh, fertilizer nitrogen looking at nitrogen effects on productivity this ran from 2003 to 2011 and it was a uh, large non-replicated pastures that were instrumented with eddy covariance systems which you see right here and this is a method whereby you are continuously monitoring the amount of carbon that's either being taken up by a field or being released by a field and and this is like it is continuous we get 20 minute averages 24 hours a day 365 days a year so we can do a complete carbon budget on that field and then we can partition that into photosynthesis and respiration to see how those two are, are behaving based on the management that you apply uh, this particular experiment had uh, variable annual nitrogen fertilizer applications and that was kind of dictated this was Penn State farmland and we just went in and said we'd like to monitor your farms and you do whatever you do and we'll monitor what happens and as I mentioned they were uh, grazed or cut uh, the previous land use had been long-term perennial forages and the initial soil content, so there were two fields instrumented like this. Uh, initial content was between 700 or 7,200 to 9,700 grams of carbon per square meter to a depth of, of one meter. And that will prove to be an important consideration in the end, is those differences in organic matter in the soil when we started the experiment. Uh, we also did a species diversity experiment started a couple of years later and these were smaller replicated paddocks and where we compared a two species mixture where we had kind of a standard orchard grass and white clover mixture versus a five species mixture where we added tall fescue and alfalfa and chicory to the orchard grass and, and white clover. And these were rotationally grazed whenever the pasture height reached about 25 centimeters and that typically resulted in five grazing bouts per year. The previous land use on this uh, experiment was a uh, dairy forage rotation where it was uh, corn, soybean, alfalfa, sometimes wheat, but kind of a mix of annual and perennial crops. And here we see the initial soil was 47 to 4,800 grams of carbon per square meter, so considerably lower. And so this is a picture of that experiment. The previous study was just on the other side of this tree line. So the same weather, basic, same soils, but, but drastic differences in our initial uh, soil carbon 
So looking closely at the results from the fertilizer study, and I say this was done at the, you know, we were just monitoring whatever the farm manager was doing. So we had what we called a high-end pasture and a, and a low-end pasture. And initially, the high-end pasture was being fertilized at about, you know, 90 to 100 kilograms uh, and per hectare per year. The low end uh, was uh, started as an alfalfa field. It still had considerable amount of alfalfa when we started, so they, but it was an alfalfa grass mixture and there was no additional nitrogen being applied. These were two very wet years and the alfalfa kind of disappeared for a while out of the pasture, so they decided to start adding a little nitrogen. Then budgets got tight at Penn State, and nitrogen got expensive, and they <laughs> applied less and less, and we got a little bit worried. They weren't, well, there wasn't going to be any nitrogen applied. So at that point, I came in and said, you know, when you, we're from the federal government, we're here to help you. In this case, <laughs> it was true. I said, we'll buy the nitrogen if you'll apply it the way I want you to. And I wanted them to do like 200 kilograms on this one and continue ma uh, managing this one the same way. Well, the first year they were so thrilled that we were buying the nitrogen that they <laughs> they, they put it everywhere. Uh, we got that sorted out. <laughs> and and so we had these kinds of differences the last three years of the, of the study. So if you look at the effects on yield, the, those first few years, uh, the, the nitrogen provided by the alfalfa would, would appear to be sufficient that we were getting very similar yields in the, in the two uh, pastures, uh, regardless of the nitrogen application rate. But when we increased the, the rates the, the last few years, as you'd expect, we saw this bump in, uh, in forage yield. So with the eddy covariance, uh, we can, like I said, we were able to break out photosynthesis or gross primary productivity versus ecosystem respiration. So this is respiration from the soil and the plants and everything. And we see that forage yield, as you would expect, was highly correlated with uh, photosynthetic uptake. And these units may look kind of weird that they're negative, but when you're doing these micromet studies, it's from the perspective of the atmosphere. So when it's negative, it means the atmosphere lost 6,500 grams of CO2 per meter per year. And respiration is positive because more CO2 went up to the atmosphere. So it, it's kind of weird. You have to get your head wrapped around production being negative and loss being positive. But nevertheless, it's you can see this positive relationship, you should expect, by, between photosynthesis and uh, yield. But the interesting thing is you also get a very significant relationship between ecosystem respiration and yield. And it's because the more inputs that you put in to the system, you, uh, you just encourage activity both from the plants and the soil biology and you get increased respiration and in fact when you plot photosynthesis versus respiration you get a very tight uh, linear relationship between the two with a slope of 0.96 so basically for every gram of CO2 that's taken up through photosynthesis you're losing 0.96 grams of CO2 through respiration. And so uh, suggesting that uh, just by increasing inputs, you're not necessarily increasing what's staying in the system because you're also increasing the outputs at approximately the same rate. Well, a couple of other ways to look at this. So net ecosystem exchange is that difference between photosynthesis and respiration. So if this is negative, it means there's greater photosynthesis than respiration. If it's positive, it means respiration is greater than photosynthesis. 
and you can see, and then it, looking at that versus forage yield, and, and here we see no relationship at all. It's just kind of scattered all over the place, the, the net total uptake. I think I say something about that there. Uh, and you see the average is here somewhere kind of right around zero, as you know, I was suggesting would be the case. Another way, if you really want to look at how much carbon is being inputted and is staying in the system, you have to not only look at photosynthesis and respiration, you have to consider how much of that biomass is being consumed by the cow and removed, or is being cut as hay and removed from the field. And then you have to think about, well, how much manure is being added back on to the field to get a complete carbon budget. And that's what we're looking at here with net biome productivity, is this net carbon budget. And again, negative means the field is accumulating carbon, and positive means it's losing carbon. And you can see across two fields, nine years, so 18 data points, there's one that is just slightly negative. And all the other years, both of these pastures were losing carbon, the amount of uh, organic matter. According to this, at equivariance, this kind of mass balance kind of uh, calculations that we're doing suggest that they were losing roughly 400 grams of CO2. And you divide that by roughly four to get carbon. So they're losing about 100 grams of carbon per meter squared per year. And, and, and that's just what I just told you. Okay, so besides looking at this gas exchange from that perspective, I mentioned we were also collecting soil cores every year as we were looking at these fields. And, and these are the data here. And so you can see we divide it into these different increments, and the high end and the low end. And in this case, positive is actually good. That that's, if it's positive, it means the pasture is taking up that amount of carbon per year. And if it's negative, it's, it's losing. And if you were to, I'm not sure if I, okay, I'm going to back up from that. I'm not sure what I circle and what I don't sometimes. But if you just look at, at the surface, and maybe the top 10 centimeters, and maybe even the top 20 centimeters, your conclusion would be that really there's not much change. That's not really significantly different from zero. These two pastures are not really different from each other. Uh, they're, they're certainly not sequestering carbon, but they're not losing all that much, and they're, they're no different from each other. You start getting down at these lower depths, and uh, at the low end, uh, still there's no really significant change, and you look at the entire profile, and it's really not different from zero. This past year, we're seeing tremendous losses of soil carbon at depth. And when you look at the entire profile, there's a very significant loss of soil organic matter over the nine years of this experiment from this pasture. And uh, so you get very different uh, results and conclusions depending on how much of the soil you, you actually look at. So, uh, in this case, the conclusion was the increasing nitrogen fertility and yield actually reduced soil carbon sequestration. Or at least it was certainly lower, whether it was due to the increased fertility or not, we can't say for sure, but it was certainly a significant loss of carbon in this high fertility pasture. So, we zip to the species diversity study and just a little bit on yield real quickly. Again, over nine years, uh, the five species mixture or the dark bars, the two species mixture are the, the light bars. In this case, uh, eight of the nine years, incre increasing the number of species in that pasture, increased uh, forage production 
an average overall nine years uh, that was about a 31 percent increase in production and that's the only thing that we did was just change the species composition and it had that kind of effect and I'm going to focus here in just a second on the last two years, 2012 and 2013, where the increase was actually more on the order of about 40 percent increase in production with the five species mixture. If you look at just the species composition real quickly in the orchard grass and white clover, so we've got our target species and then weeds and we see it starts you know, really high for the target species, hardly any weeds, and as you kind of see the, the number of weeds increases over time and our target species uh, kind of decrease a bit. The five species mixture, uh, chicory, was the first year was almost half of the biomass, and then it disappears very quickly. Uh, Alfalfa kind of disappears over time, and uh, what does become fairly dominant is was tall fescue in the mixture. And uh, and again, weeds were, were very low, and then a, a bit of an increase towards the end of the study. And so we, we got looking, and for a long time we just weeds was everything that wasn't a target species, and we didn't separate them. But as we started to see that many weeds appear, we decided we'd, we should identify what they were because, again, our definition was a weed that so was just not planted here. So if tall fescue happened to be in this pasture, it was a weed. So if you look at the last two years of the study and the proportion of total biomass, you see both of our mixtures had become essentially orchard grass, white clover, tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass mixtures. Mm -hmm. And the two species, the Kentucky bluegrass and tall fescue, had come into that mixture. The bluegrass had come into the five species mixture, and I say the alfalfa and chicory had kind of disappeared. And so we had essentially the same kind of species composition those last two years, but yet the five species mixture was still out yielding the two species mixture by 40 percent. And so there is certainly some kind of carryover, the residual. If you look at the soil carbon, the uh, same kind of layout as before. And again, if you just look at the upper soil layers, you would say there was no difference between these. Uh, two pastures, these two treatments, and if you just looked at the top five centimeters, you would say they were both sequestering carbon at exactly the same rate. When you get down and you look at the entire profile, you'll see that the two species mixture was positive, but the slope was not significantly different than zero, so there's an indication that it might have been sequestering some carbon whereas the five species mixture was very definitely a significantly positive and about three times the amount of, of carbon being sequestered. And my thoughts are, uh, suggest that it could possibly be because of this additional carbon and additional organic matter, the improved uh, uh, just soil health, if you will, over time that we were able to continue to see the, the boost in productivity uh, because of the changes that had, had taken place. Okay, and so in this case, increasing diversity was associated with both an increase in yield and an increase in soil carbon sequestration. And so uh, we have a nitrogen fertility study where the high-end pasture had greater yield but lost a significant amount of soil carbon, whereas the change in carbon in the low-end pasture was not significantly different from zero. In the diversity mixture, the five-species mixture had greater yield and sequestered more carbon, whereas again the soil carbon in the two-species mixture was not significantly different from zero. And so you have to, you know, why, you know, why the difference between studies? 
right it in one case we have increased production and increased sequestration in the other case increased production was associated with lower sequestration and here I think is suggestive this is looking at the change in soil carbon over time versus the initial soil carbon at the time the experiment started as I mentioned in this study that was that high-end pasture that had this very high amount of soil carbon to begin with the biodiversity study was back here kind of on this these fields that have been depleted a little bit and you know it's only four data points and they're not from the same study but I think it's suggestive that where you start is as important or perhaps even more important than the management that you apply to the soil when you start to consider what if you're going to sequester carbon or not sequester carbon in the soil so just again to summarize increasing and fertility or pasture species diversity increased yield only the increasing yield with species diversity was associated with an increase in soil carbon another thing a lot of people just assume that if you have a pasture you're going to be storing soil carbon and that is not necessarily the case in these two studies long-term studies of four different treatments only one had a significant increase in soil organic matter over the nine years one had a very significant loss of soil carbon and two were roughly unchanged and so so you can't just assume that perennial pastures or carbon sinks and then again the conclusion that it may be that initial soil conditions are more important than your management that you're applying and if you're trying to apply management to a soil that is already saturated and expect it to increase soil organic matter it's probably not going to happen okay and I think that's oh and I acknowledge all the people that helped with this and I I don't know if I have time for a question or two yes 